you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. He, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> hey guys, Matt here. Mike and I, with the help of our fellows, Phil Craven and Patrick Russell, just got done teaching an ultrasound course to an amazing group of St. Lucian physicians. They're just really excited about providing better care with this technology. Now, I mention this because it's in conjunction with a course that was held in Cuba by Developing EM. If you haven't heard of this group, go to developingem.com right now. Support them. Uh, sign up and go to their conferences. It's a really great thing. They're dedicated to just improving care in resource-limited areas. It's a good thing to get behind. Go check them out. Now, on with the podcast. Hi, it's Maxime Valois and Jean-François Langteau. After a full first month on Twitter, we're now convinced. Through foam, we got to listen to Justin Bora's fabulous smack talk on IVC assessment. What? You didn't hear that talk? Well, then go to the Life in the Fast Lane site and look it up. It was a talk given at Smack last year, which reminds me, Mike and I will be at Smack this year and we're crazy excited. Registration is open and we specifically will be teaching an ultrasound workshop pre-event with the brilliant James Rippey. And then we'll be giving a talk at the conference. To be honest, I think the workshop may already be full uh, because there are only a few spots left as of this recording. But really there are much smarter people talking about incredibly cool other topics that we're totally bummed we can't attend because we'll be teaching. So go register. Check out Bower's talk from last year. And then you can also listen to Scott's smack back on the EM crit site. I know it's a lot of homework to fully appreciate this talk, but it's worth it. Or just keep listening. What they say here is really great stuff regardless of the background you have. And sorry about the waves in the background, That's uh, I'm still in St. Lucia. And although it's definitely one of the greatest IVC talks ever, we've got a couple of comments. We agree with what he said and don't intend to refer to any study. Most, if not all of IVC talks, limit themselves to... Well, the IVC, and looking only at an IVC is, in our minds, narrow framing and certainly not the way to make full use of its potential. Interpretation of IVC will need considering what's going on with the heart and with the lungs, and most of all, putting all that together in a wider view of things. The next step in point of care ultrasound evolution is to go from an organ-based approach to a problem or physiology-based approach. So Jean-Francois, please show us those Guyton and Starling curves, shall you? All right. Hello, everyone. I think you can think of this podcast uh, kind of like the physiologic basis for uh, EGLS. So volume, to give or not to give. Indeed, it's a question that's often frowned with uncertainty. And we'll see today how a qualita uh, qualitative assessment of the circulation can help minimize this uncertainty. Not only because bedside ultrasound is an extension of the physical exam, but more so because it's a wonderful window that allows us to see in real time the physiology at work in our shock patient. So what I want to do is integrate this relatively new information brought by lung ultrasound, heart ultrasound, and IVC ultrasound, and, and combine it to old concepts about venous return and cardiac output that have been known for decades. This means we have to start from the beginning, by acknowledging the fact that venous return must be equal to cardiac output if you're at steady state in normal condition. It also implies that uh, stroke volume of right ventricle is the same as stroke volume of left ventricle. And any condition that uh, disrupts this significantly or uh, constantly will cause a drop in uh, oxygen tissue delivery. And if this is not quickly corrected, the imbalance between oxygen demand and delivery can rapidly cause shock and death. So how can we correct this? Well, sometimes the answer is quite easy. Take pneumothorax or tamponade, for instance, it's with a needle. But besides this, there's really only two ways you can correct the mismatch. Either you decrease oxygen demand or you increase its delivery. And besides intubation and, and sedation, are ways to rapidly decrease oxygen demand are rather limited. Hence, the question rapidly becomes, how can we deliver more oxygen to the body? Two full minutes with no ultrasound images. What's going on here? Yeah, we hear you. This is a little different than our normal podcast. All the IVC talk and how-to is great, and it's what we like delivering, but you really can't fully appreciate all that without a super solid background that these gents are attempting to give you right now. So patient grasshopper, your concentration and focus on this pathophysiology will pay dividends to you and your patients. 
just to make you feel better we're going to put up a countdown to ultrasound counter in the corner here don't worry it's coming trust me it's worth this initial investment in the pathophys well obviously through intubation oxygenation or a transfusion to increase transport uh, oxygen transport capacity but whatever we do it will rapidly come down to how can we optimize cardiac output and venous return? And this is where our ability to assess volume and predict fluid responsiveness become crucial. And we have to start with the Starling curve because it illustrates the relation between cardiac output and preload. And predicting fluid responsiveness would be quite easy if we could pinpoint for any patient exactly where he stood on this curve. This fellow would be a good responder. This one a little bit less. And finally, the third one here might even be armed. Because the starling curve helps us understand quite instinctively that if the patient lies on this portion of the curve for both right and left ventricle, he'll be a fluid responder. And if he's on the flatter part of it, he will not. But of course, it's not always that easy to know where our patient stands on this curve. But then we also need to know the uh, general slope of the Starling curve. And I'm sure it's not big news for you if I tell you that cardiac output not only depends on preload, but also on contractility and afterload. And they will have a significant impact on the slope of the Starling curve. Take this normal heart, for instance, and the Starling curve associated with it. Now, if you submit this heart to increase afterload, Think of massive P for the right heart or aortic stenosis for the left or in conditions associated with decreases in contractility like a big myocardial infarction. Well, then the Starling curve becomes flatter. And here, higher preloads are not necessarily associated with increases in cardiac output. Instead, conditions that will relieve the obstruction or increase uh, contractility uh, will have much more impact on cardiac output. And then you also have conditions where your patient is in shock but has increased cardiac contractility. Early sepsis would be an example here. And usually these conditions, you'll have a low preload and low afterload and a combination of the two. And here, volume expansion will play a central role. Now, we also need to take into account venous return because a significant drop in it will cause shock. And one of the easiest way to cause a drop in venous return will be to increase right atrial pressure. Now this is the Guyton curve for venous return. It illustrates uh, what venous return does in different physiological condition. But the only thing important here, the only notion here for now that we need to grasp is that venous return will fall as right atrial pressures get higher and higher. Now, such conditions as tension pneumothorax or tamponade, or uh, we can add a massive P in the mix, well, they will cause shock mainly through this mechanism. Now, here's a scheme of venous return, and it shows that for blood to become preload for the heart, it needs to flow from the venous reservoir through the large veins and IVC and push against the pressure in the right atrium, push against right atrial pressure. Now only a small proportion of the total amount of blood contained in the veins is actually responsible for this flow and is the stress volume. It gives the pressure to venous return. It's the driving force behind venous return. Now if you were to bleed to death, obviously you would bleed what's in your arteries and your stress volume. What would remain in your vein would be unstressed volume. Unstressed volume is the minimal amount of blood required to fill the veins, but without generating any tension on the, on the walls. It does not generate pressure. It does not generate venous return. Now, what this scheme illustrates is that for any fixed value of right atrial pressure, really the only way you can change venous return is to either change with vasoactive agents the ratio of stress to unstressed volume by giving vasodilators or vasoconstrictors, or you can change total volume. And if we translate this back to the guiding curve, this means that 
in hypovolemic states or venodilated states, venous return will be lower for any right atrial pressure value. Okay, can I interrupt here? I know some of you listen to these podcasts while you're doing, uh, I don't know, whatever you're doing. But this isn't one to do that on. This is pretty intense stuff with really great graphics. Mike and I are pretty simple guys, and you could probably get away with just listening to some of our podcasts. But I would suggest you save this one until you can sit down, look at the graphics and illustrations that go along with it, and make sure you grasp these concepts. These French Canucks are deep. That's why we give volume or we give presser that will shift blood from the unstressed compartment to the stressed compartment. And this will increase venous return for every right atrial pressure value. Now, if you remember, we said that the amount of blood that flows in the heart must be the same as the amount of blood that goes out from the heart. This means conceptually that the Guyton curve for venous return can be superimposed on the Starling curve. And the patient necessarily must be at the intersection of these two curves because venous return must be equal to cardiac output. And these curves can be plotted against right atrial pressure. And for any value of right atrial pressure, venous return equals cardiac output. And this relation of right atrial pressure to the circulation probably explains why the surrogate marker for right atrial pressure, the central venous pressure, has long been thought to be uh, useful in predicting fluid responsiveness. But we know now that it has serious limitations. That's because it's a static marker. It leaves us totally blind to the slope of the Starling curve. Indeed, to predict fluid responsiveness, we need to have some sense of the slope of the Starling curve. And this can only be achieved using dynamic predictors. Okay, you get that? Now this is why you've heard Stone and Weingart say over and over the last couple of weeks that static measures for volume responsiveness are as useless as a bicycle pedal on a wheelchair. Well, they didn't say that exactly. That was my crazy uncle. But clearly, you need dynamic measures so you get a sense of the slope of the curve. Well said, Jean-Francois and crazy uncle Billy. And this is where bedside ultrasound comes into play. And we'll see now how... A simple qualitative assessment of the circulation comprising lung, heart, and IVC assessment can help us not only establish the slope of the Starling curve, but also the portion of it that applies to our particular patient. So first off, the slope. Now, if you see a normal heart here, a normal left ventricle, that would be the Starling curve associated with it. And here, as far as volume goes, you can pretty much do whatever you want as long as you quickly reassess. But if I showed you a heart like this with severely depressed left ventricular function, probably everyone that listens to this podcast right now would draw the Starling curve like this. And here, volume's not our best bet, at least not volume alone. Same goes with conditions associated with sharp increases in afterload. And because... The right heart is also as important as the left heart. Well, all the conditions causing significant right ventricular strain, decreases in right ventricular contractility, massive myocardial infarction, or massive P, sharp increases in afterload. Well, they will also greatly affect the potential for fluid response. And finally, you'll have shock conditions that looks like this here with an increased contractility of the left ventricle shown here with by the kissing of the left ventricular wall well here volume expansion plays a central role because usually these conditions will be uh, associated with decreases in preload and afterload i think now this illustrates how a simple eyeball assessment of the heart can help us establish the general slope of the Starling curve. Let us now see how adding IVC and lung assessment can help us establish more precisely the portion of it that applies to our patient. All right, can I attempt to greatly oversimplify and insult the intelligence of John Francois at this point? So look at these hearts. Which one of these looks like it wants fluid? 
that slow, droopy one on the bottom or that fast, gimme, gimme, gimme volume one on the top. Yeah, you get a qualitative sense that the top one wants volume, right? No? Come on. Well, fine. Continue with your smarty pants complicated teachings, or as some of you would call it, accurate. Now, the IVC will be assessed from the subcostal window. And in near field, you have the liver. In red here, the right atrium. And the IVC in its longitudinal plane of cut. And this is where we'd assess the respiratory variability. And recently, I think there's been a debate regarding the real utility of this assessment to predict fluid responsiveness. So I think we need to um, pay a little uh, closer look. So to do this, let's go back to the scheme of venous return. Now adding uh, ultrasound images. Now in hypovolemic or distributive states, the stressed volume goes down and the amount of blood flowing in the IVC is reduced. It, the pressure in the IVC decreases, so the respiratory variability increases. Same goes for drops in right atrial pressure because the, the, the blood can freely enter the heart. At the end of the spectrum, you have a complete collapse of the IVC. And usually, in a shock patient, this would tend to suggest that your, the patient is either hypovolemic or vasodilated or both, and that his right atrial pressure is probably close to zero. And here, I don't think many people would hesitate to give fluids here, because if the patient is not fluid responsive, he should at least be uh, fluid tolerant. But what happens when the IVC is only uh, minimally variable, like here? Maybe you gave a lot of uh, volume. Or maybe the patient has a chronic comorbidity, causing uh, increases in right atrial pressure. Well, here, predicting fluid responsiveness becomes a bit trickier. Now, for a, let's say, a single patient that we would do uh, multiple assessment, if initially his IVC looks like this, as we give him more and more fluid, we'd expect the variability to decrease. And where, and when we arrive at a point where there's roughly no more variability, it's more fixed, uh, this would tend to imply that the patient is probably getting closer to the part where he's now no longer preload dependent. He's closer to the, the flatter part of the starting curve. But still... A fixed and dilated IVC is not in and of itself a contraindication to fluid uh, fluid therapy. To illustrate th this, let's come back to uh, a scheme showing uh, multiple uh, uh, starling curves. All right, get ready to have your minds blown. So f basically four different patients. Patient A, patient A has low contractility. Patient B as a reduced cardiac compliance and compare them to patient C, a normal patient. If we drew a line here, they would all have the same uh, right atrial pressure that would tend to be high, so a roughly fixed IVC. But these three patients cannot possibly have the same potential for fluid response. Patient A has decreased contractility either right, left, or both, and we would not expect this patient to be that much fluid responsive. Patient B has a significant pericardial effusion causing a decrease in right side chamber uh, compliance. And here, until we put a needle in the pericardium, we'd expect this patient to be fluid responsive. And finally, we've seen that when the, when the contractility looks uh, roughly normal, probably that the potential for fluid response will probably be limited when the IVC is completely tanked. So I think this illustrates how it can be problematic to use IVC variability in isolation when we're trying to predict fluid responsiveness. Okay, so was your mind as blown as mine was just then? Now that was a ridiculously awesome, concise way of summing up in just over a minute how static measures of IVC by themselves aren't really very predictive and a great illustrative case it gave there, or cases. If you didn't get that or see the examples, watch again. So when we see articles like this one saying that IVC variability is a poor predictor of fluid responsiveness, I think what it really means is that IVC variability is a poor independent predictor of fluid responsiveness. Of course it is. 
it needs to be put in the context of the whole circulation. Well, obviously, the heart, but also the lung. So here's a uh, an image showing lung ultrasound with the uh, ribs here, uh, shadowing artifacts and the pleural line. And we see stemming from the pleural line, a, an echogenic vertical artifact going all the way down to far field, and it's a beeline. Now here's a clip showing an interstitial syndrome. Again, the landmarks. And an interstitial syndrome uh, is defined by three or more beelines between two ribs. And this can mean that the patient is in cardiogenic pulmonary edema because these beelines have been shown to correlate with increased wedge pressures. In other words, with increased filling pressures of the left ventricle. So this means that if a patient initially has a lung that looks like the video on bottom left, where there's no lung sliding, uh, I'm sorry, no beelines, well, give him enough fluid to put him in pulmonary edema, and you'll see these beelines gradually appearing, initially at the base and progressively more anteriorly. The opposite's also true. If you remove fluid, these beelines will progressively go away. But the correlation, as you can see, is far from perfect. And that's because there's a differential to these beelines. Because non-cardiogenic pulmonary, pulmonary edema, like ARDS, can also produce beelines. Lung fibrosis, interstitial pneumonias, contusions. But nevertheless, if we translate this back to the Starling curve, if we see them gradually appearing in the lungs of our patient, this means it's time to stop giving fluids and start thinking about pressors and inotropes. And since these beelines also correlate with wedge pressures, with filling pressures, we should expect these beelines to be associated with poor left ventricle function. Now, what happens when we combine all this information? Well, these curves will literally come to life. And now, not only do we have a sense of the slope of the Starling curve of our patient with our focused echo. But if we add the lung and IVC assessment, we also have a sense of the more specific part of it that applies to our particular patient. And this for most patients we see in the first few hours is, I think is, is sophisticated enough and with the right amount of training can be done by everyone. Now, obviously, some patients will remain unstable despite continued resuscitation, and usually they'll end up stacked here. And maybe we need more tools then. But whatever the tool we choose, we'll always be doing the same thing. That is, uh, inducing a small change in preload and watch its effect on uh, cardiac output change. What are the options? For as far as the change in preload goes. Well, obviously, we can uh, bolus the patient or we can uh, raise his legs. And if he's intubated in sinus rhythm, well sedated, we can take advantage of, uh, of uh, heart-lung interactions and their uh, small effect on preload. Now, usually, we want to measure a change of at least 13 to 15% to consider our patient uh, fluid responsive. I mean 30 to 13 to 15% uh, change in cardiac output. Now we can measure this we'll, we'll, with continuous monitoring of uh, either pulse pressure or uh, stroke volume variation, uh, devices like FlowTrack. And we can also use echo for this, but should we choose to use echo, we have to be sure to be right on par with our Doppler technique because if we have too much uncertainties in our value, it can lead us, it can be very misleading to say the least. But I guess that would be the subject of a whole other talk. And for today, I will stop here. And I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, go to echoguidedlifesupport.com and it will be our pleasure to uh, chat and communicate with you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Wow, great stuff. So I think you've got it now. That makes five podcasts we publish on volume responsiveness. But you know what they say, six times the charm. So we have one more for you. We saved it for last because we think it's kind of next, you know, possibly the future. So what you just watched, though, this was great stuff. You should watch this over and over until you get it. But the holy grail throughout all this fluid responsiveness talk has been to find some way, a super quick way, super easy way to measure and answer the question, is this patient volume responsive? There are issues with the IVC, issues logistically with PLR, passive leg raise, and cardiac output measurements. But there is a technique that some people are studying and think may be the way to go. And we'll bring it to you next time. Stay tuned. And don't forget to register for CASFest where we can discuss all of this with you in person and practice with you. Sound. That's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it.